Today, I'll talk to Heather and Felicia about the new things that just opened at Disney World. That's coming up on this episode 414 of WW Prep to Go. Hello and welcome to WW Prep to Go, Retalk Strategy and Ideas for People Planning Their Disney Road Trips. I am your host, Shannon Albert from WDWPrepSchool.com. Thank you for being here for episode 414. Every time I have to say the numbers, I debate 414, 414 for some reason. This series of numbers is really tripping me up, but today it's 414. Today's podcast is an interview with Heather and Felicia, who are on my team, who just got back from Disney World. We decided to split up our trips recently. So Jenny and I went over Memorial Weekend and did some things to open then. And then Heather and Felicia went in June a couple of weeks later to do some of the things that opened then. But because I wasn't there, I couldn't record a podcast to tell you what was happening. So instead, I'm talking to them today. They are going to share about some things they repeated that we've done in the past and their current thoughts on those things, but also the new things that just opened, including Epcot and Animal Kingdom. Before I jump into the, that conversation, a reminder to follow on social media, search WDW Prep School on your favorite platform, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok in particular. I also send out usually a couple emails a week. So if you want to be on the email list, please sign up for that, where we try to keep you posted on everything you need to know to plan your trip. And if you want to be a Trip Report guest, please use the SpeakPipe information in the show notes so that you can submit. And then if you're chosen, a member of my team will reach out and ask you to be on and set up that appointment. I think that's it for now. Without any further ado, here's my chat with Heather and Felicia. Welcome, Felicia and Heather. Hello. Hello, Shannon. This is a different sort of thing because we split up our trips recently. So I wasn't there to record. So I'm excited to talk to you guys about how your trip went. Let's get the one big thing out of the way, which was the weather. What? Yeah. Oh, I know we're not going to talk about it the whole time. I just want to okay. get it out of the way. Because if anyone's going soon, I feel like they need to know. Yeah. It, it was hot. Yes. It was a mix of very hot and humid, followed by very, very rainy. So... I think hopefully in the next, I think the week or two, it's supposed to be very rainy or in Orlando, but it mm. is still very hot and very humid outside of that. Yeah. And that was a thing that we had during our trip as well, which was Memorial Weekend. And it's mm -hmm. it's not that we don't expect hot. It's that it's unseasonably hot. And so it's, it's intense, like 100 to 110 degree heat index every day. That's too much. Yeah, it was it was a lot. And it, it does give me a slight bit of comfort when you read other people's experiences right now, because sometimes I, I worry that maybe it's just the frequency of our trips. You know, you start to it starts to make them a little bit more difficult on the body. But when everybody else is saying the same thing, I it really, truly is very warm right now in the parks. Yeah. And it takes extra care, like breaks and things like that. Yes. So. Anyway, that was a persistent thing for you. And then you also had rain. We did not have too many problems with the rain, but yours was torrential. Yes. Which is also a bummer. I always, as much as I hate, feel bad for us during our trips, I feel so much worse for other people. Like we get to go all the time. So it's not a once in a lifetime trip. If we don't get to go on a ride, it's fine. And when we do festivals or parties, then it becomes a bigger issue because mm -hmm. it can get in the way of our, our work. But in general... It's the other people I feel the worst for. Yeah. So anyway, that was an unfortunate thing that you guys had that we also had. And other people traveling soon may also encounter as well. But you guys did a lot of things during your trip that were both repeats of things that we did in May. So I want to hear your thoughts compared to ours, but also repeats of things we've done in the past, like before this year. So I just want to kind of go through the list. Let's start with the the drone show. Okay, so we did the drone show one night, and there are two showings of it, usually at 9 and 1045, and our first showing was canceled for rain. So we stuck around and did the 1045 drone show, and I will say the viewing area was very congested, very busy, but there were spaces for everyone, and it was easy to see, and it was super cute. 
I was a big fan of the the drone show. I yeah, I would agree. I think it's kind of for shows you feel this need to have to be on the front row, but for something like this drone show where it's taking place in the sky and it's up above, you don't have to be in the very front row. So that shouldn't be a huge concern even for for little ones for like for the little kids. I think they'll they're fine being, you know, in that second, third, fourth row. I was also I the the way that that pathway is laid out where people are standing it I was kind of intimidated because it did feel like Felicia said it's very congested but it wasn't nearly as bad as what I thought it was going to be very organized Disney has it kind of fixed and tweaked I think the issues they were having before and that seemed to go pretty smoothly so it sounds like it worked the same as when we were there and we were the first night that they had got the new system in place so i assumed it would uh, stick around because it was better Mm -hmm. but you entered down by the house of blues or to soleil area and then you just walked and walked until whatever where did you stop and watch the show we stopped right in front of summer house i believe is where we were watching from Mm -hmm. and so everyone does enter on the house of blue side and then everyone at the end i think exits towards the starbucks side by the the balloon Mm-hmm. And so we were closer down to the Starbucks balloon side. And I think we arrived 20 minutes before 20 the minutes. show. Yeah. And it's standing to wait for it is similar to standing to wait for fireworks crowds at Magic Kingdom. You're going to be close to other people, but it's not necessarily as bad because it's only, you know, four or five rows of people waiting, not an entire mass of people. Yeah. Yeah. And so with that traffic flow in mind, like we arrived by uber or lyft on that end Mm -hmm. and then we left by disney bus because we were already we were exiting towards the middle yeah so i was like well let's just go to the bus stop and that was kind of the flow of things and so speaking of summer house there are some dining reservations that offer drone show viewing so if people want to avoid it i think summer house haleo and i think you said house of blues is doing something Yes, I think theirs is, and Felicia, correct me if I'm wrong wrong on this. We tried to uh, see if we could figure this one out, but we couldn't find where where to go exactly. But House House of Blues has advertised that they will open up their lawn area with the caveat that you have to purchase a drink at their bar. Is is that right, Felicia? Yeah, it's like a porch patio area on Mm -hmm. the back. And I I think the issue with our night was that that first show was canceled, mm-hmm. but I've seen where they have a table, like temporary bar set up outside. And if you go up there and purchase it on your entrance in, then you're allowed to go up to the porch patio area. And I think maybe in our night, we could have gone inside to mm. purchase a drink and then gone out. But yeah, that one is just purchasing. And then the other two options, the Summer House and Haleo, you actually pay per person just for the ability to sit at one of the tables mm-hmm. and then also order food and drink from there. Yeah, so some people would like that option. It's sort of like a dessert party at Magic yes. Kingdom or something. Yes. So mm-hmm. that seems like a really good option because it is good viewing right there mm-hmm. along the water. Before they started offering this, I think people were just hanging out for hours, mm-hmm. which we saw too when we were walking along that path to go to our viewing. We we're like, oh, these people are just hanging out, but now you have to pay to sit there. So anyway... So overall, good experience. I think the fact that your first show was canceled and our first show was canceled should be a bit of a warning to people that it's more likely to be canceled than fireworks. Yes. Yeah, for for sure. And when they canceled our first show, they also didn't know at that point if the second show would happen. Mm -hmm. So it was 830. We had to wait till 1045 and there was no certainty it was going to occur, but we didn't have any more rain in the radar. So we hoped it would happen and it did. And our cancellation, I still have no idea why. There was no rain. Mm. It must have been wind. I did see a TikTok of a drone plunging into the water. Yes. And we had one plunge during our show as well. Did. Oh, my yes. gosh. During the same sequence, the it was the Death Star sequence. And I was kind of debating, like, I wonder what why that sequence seems to be so bad. But it looked like one fell and then it hit another one on the way down. It was very sad. That seems expensive. Yeah, loses a drone every show or something. For real. So anyway, okay. So overall, it sounds like the, they've got the system down. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to think about the first couple of days, which were chaos. And hopefully that situation will happen again. 
Another thing that you guys repeated was H2O Glow After Hours. Yes, we did. And that was lovely. It it felt busy. Like there were a lot of people there and the lines were for the like slides and different attractions were low posted wait times, but the actual wait was relatively high comparatively. So if I said it was a five minute wait, we would see it be closer to a 15 minute wait. Or if it was a posted 10 minute wait, took like 30 minutes to get through. But we didn't experience the same thing as you in that we didn't get chilly. Like our, Mm. it was comfortable outside the entire time. The water was comfortable and never felt cold. And it was a a great time. The coldest water for us was on the lazy river. The water that sprays at you was Mm. like ice water. And so by the time we went around and around seven times, it was like we're just covered in ice water. (laughs) Yeah, that part is a little chilly, but. We didn't experience the same, like, being chilled getting out of the water, for instance. Mm -hmm. We, you know, walked around in wet bathing suits and were totally comfortable, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, I felt felt silly talking about being chilly because it was so, so hot during the day. (laughs) I'm like, I just sound like a complainer, but it it really was amazingly chilly. So do you still think that that event is better value than a regular Typhoon Lagoon ticket for a lot of people? Yes. I do. Overall, I, yes. Yeah. I think I I think it's a great option. I think being able to enter at six o'clock is just like with the other after hours events, getting to enter a couple hours, you know, before the official start time to the event is a key component of that to kind of up the value. And I although it was more crowded than mm-hmm. what our very first experience, Shannon, was when we went to mm-hmm. that first H2O Glow a couple years ago. It's, it was still less crowded than a busy afternoon at Typhoon Lagoon. We had no problem finding chairs. There were plenty of places where you could sit. The lines for the food that you pay for weren't too bad. The lines for the treats were a little bit longer, but I also feel that it's that way at most of the after-hour events. Not every location was that way, but the the ones around the wave pool... And around the exit of like Crush and Gusher, those ones were kind of long, but the ones up further away weren't too bad. So I I do think. And also because I prefer not to get like sunburned, I do really like the fact that you can spend five hours at a water park and not worry about the sun. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, I feel like there are two different types of water park goers, and it depends on what type you are, if that's a good event for you. I personally like water parks because I like being in the sunshine and I like sitting out in the sun and getting warm and then cooling off in the water and going back and forth and just being able to be comfortably in the sun. And so that, you know, I couldn't do that in this situation. So it's not my favorite way to enjoy a water park. I probably wouldn't personally go back, but it wasn't because I didn't have a great time. I did. I would just prefer to go during the day. So if you're someone that enjoys going to water parks or pools during the day, then it probably isn't a good value or fit for you because you're getting something you're not looking for but it's a great event yeah Mm -hmm. i I do still think the lines were shorter too Mm -hmm. so if doing all the rides is an important thing and riding the slides is important i think you're going to get more bang for your buck at the after hours versus trying to do it at noon on a on a tuesday or whatever agreed very much agreed okay another thing that you guys did that was uh, a repeat-ish is that we did 1900 Park Fair breakfast. You did 1900 Park Fair dinner. Yes. How how was that? It was lovely. We I, I think we got very lucky with our experience, but I think even if it hadn't gone the way that it did, it would have been a great meal. Like the food, I, everything I got was delicious. Mm-hmm. It was good quality. You know, they had things like prime rib and like sliced turkey, carved turkey, very nice sides, desserts. Everything was clean and well put together. And the characters were great. I will say it was loud, like keeps being referenced, but I didn't find it much louder than any other character oh. meal I've been to recently. So that wasn't really off-putting what, to me. What time was your reservation? 5.45? Yeah. 5.45? So, so prime dinner time. Yeah. I I did not think it was any louder than Chef Mickey's or even I Kate made breakfast. Like I did her house. Yeah, I I did. For the record, I did. 
Like I was, I was covering my ears at times. Like it was so loud. I do think the cavernous room kind of Mm -hmm. does make it feel amplified. Mm -hmm. But having done a lot of the character meals in the last year, I think I've just come to expect that maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it it is loud. So if you're not used to doing meals like that, which obviously I'm not saying you're not used to that, Shannon, um, but for others, (laughs) yeah, yes, yeah, Um, it could be a lot to get used to. But I didn't, it wouldn't prevent me from going to that particular character meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I am a sensitive to sound. So Disney World is a rough place overall for that. But I, mm-hmm. I did find it to be a lot louder. However, it got better as people left. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but you like the food. Um, you thought it was mm-hmm. loud, but not any louder than most character meals. And then what about mm-hmm. the characters? We had such a great experience, which was something that uh, we haven't necessarily had at other meals where you're waiting and waiting and waiting for that last character to come around. We saw all four before we even got up and got our first plate. So we were able to then enjoy our meal while not having to worry about the characters. That was just totally luck of the draw. It was so getting to see them all in a row was fantastic like that. But then just the characters themselves were so amazing. Mirabelle is an absolute delight. Tiana was great. Cinderella, Aladdin, they, it's such a fun combination. And that restaurant kind of known for having kind of an interesting combination of characters. So I'm really glad they stuck with that. And yeah, so they were just, they were a lot of fun, a hoot. And you had Aladdin was there for yours. Yeah. Because I yes. read a stat that said he's only there about two thirds of the time. Oh, and wow. I, and when he's not there, it's, it's no white a lot of times. Mm-hmm. So mm, no it's wait. not not guaranteed but th- i would say i felt the same way about the character interactions and there's been a few times in meeting characters where i felt like i was really talking to the characters mm-hmm. you know and i feel like i got a lot of that there mm-hmm. like they're yeah. really in it yeah and sometimes you have to force the conversation more like be more engaging mm-hmm. to get something from them and i felt like with the characters at this meal they just they take the lead like if you don't have something to say or to start the conversation with, they just show up and start talking. They're all in. Yeah, and they will start to interact with you. And even if you don't know what to say in response to their interaction, they somehow just keep it going for you. So yeah, I, you know, I often feel some anxiety mm-hmm. communicating with the characters and that made it so much better. It was, it was a great experience, I felt like, in that way. I think that's a good note or a good thing to point out because people do feel that way about characters a lot. And these characters were just fun. I felt yeah. like I was watching them in their world or something. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. I just I just didn't feel a lot of pressure to do anything. <laughs> no. And I have this love-hate relationship with the face characters versus the non-face characters in that I'm kind of dreading having the conversations with them. But like Felicia said, these ones were amazing. And it's so much easier than trying to figure out the hand signals and the motions that a non-face character makes. Because sometimes I feel like they're desperately trying to tell me something and I am not getting the message. Mm-hmm. So being able to actually speak with someone, is it's a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. So overall, a good experience. Yeah. I yep, loved it. We might have to look at our ranking of character meals again and see where it falls. Mm-hmm. One other thing about... The food in the buffet that I noticed, and it could just be because it's new or the time that we were there, but I feel like often the buffets can be kind of chaotic, like there's food. It's it's kind of a mess just because there are people constantly going through it, and I felt like they did such a good job keeping the area like fully stocked, clean. It felt like every time I went up, I was getting it like almost like no one had been there, like we were getting there at the very beginning of the meal because they did such a good job keeping on top of it. And I think it's a little bit smaller of selections, like yes, options than some that. of the other ones. And so I think it's easier for them to be higher quality options and then they keep on top of it better and they're fresher. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's, it's not the same amount of selection that you might have at a, like Chef Mickey. Chef Mickey's seems like they have a huge number of, of options, but what they do have is really, really good. Including gummy bears. Yes. <laughs> I like a meal that includes gummy bears. And I was there for breakfast 
And I was like, okay, let me have my egg, <laughs> my waffle, and gummy bears. And gummy bears, as one does. <laughs> That's fun. When, when in Disneyland, eat, eat gummy bears for breakfast or dinner, whichever it is. Okay, so another thing that you revisited that we've done in the past was Space 220 Lounge. Mm, yes. So I've recently done the like full Space 220 meal. And by recently, I mean in the last year. And I was seated towards, not toward one of the windows, but we were at least facing a window. And that was fine. But for our Space 220 Lounge reservation this time, we were seated at the bar top. And you just face away from the windows. You don't get any of the interaction. And that I would highly recommend against, especially if yeah. you have a reservation. Maybe if you're a walk-up and you just went in there, it's okay. But that wasn't fantastic. The food was okay. It was fine. The service was, fine. was great. Mm -hmm. But also, one thing that makes it even more amazing that you were sat at the bar is that you guys said it was not busy. It was no. not busy. And to be fair, they asked, are you okay sitting at the bar? And with without hesitation, we were like, sure. Like, not even thinking of the fact that the entire show and the reason why you're there is going to be behind you. And, and when, to be fair, we had tried to check in 20, like 20 minutes yes. prior, 25 minutes prior. And they're like, we have nothing available right now. You need to come back later. And so then we came back at our actual reservation time. And at that point, they said, are you okay sitting at the bar top? And so we thought everything is just full and that's what's available uh -huh. right now. And then we walk in and there are tables everywhere. The entire bar top, except for two seats, is open. And yeah, it was that way the whole time that we were dining in there. Yeah, it was it was and, a little wild. And the the other thing that I didn't really love about sitting at the bar is that it's got the padded edge, like this big, thick padded edge, which is fine if you're just having drinks. But if you're eating, then, you know, your plate is sitting back, I don't know, like six inches further away from you than it, what it would be. So there's just lots of little reasons that made the bar a bit of a challenge for anything beyond than just going in and cooling off and grabbing a quick drink. I feel like the bar seating should be reserved for walk-ups, as Agreed. it is in many restaurants. Agreed. Yes. So I think my takeaway is having done both semi recently is I would definitely go for the lounge reservation mm -hmm. and make sure that I say I'm not comfortable sitting at a bar top so I can sit on an actual table because if you do the lounge you can choose from their individual like a la carte items like a lounge snacks I don't remember small plates or whatever mm -hmm. uh -huh. but you also have the option to do the three course meal if you sit in the lounge area but you don't mm -hmm. have to versus the rest of the restaurant you have to do the multi-course meal Yes, it's so. all one price and not inexpensive. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, another thing that you did that we haven't done in a long time is the Fantasmic uh, dinner package. Yes. Yeah. It's been, I think, you, Shane, I think you and I went to fan, just to Fantasmic right after it reopened. Mm -hmm. we, we made it. But actually doing the package for me has been a long time since doing it. And you guys ate at 50s prime time? Yes. Yes, we did. And there, and there are five were lots of options. Oh, sorry, oh, Felicia. No, that's okay. I was going to say there are five different restaurants you can go to. And all of them on our day and leading up to it had plenty of reservations available for the dining package, which is not to say that if you go during a busier time, that's mm -hmm. what you will see. But it was very easy to get into to choose a time we wanted. Yeah, and it wasn't weird times either. It was like normal meal times. So that's what I was going to ask, because a lot of the dining packages, the reason they offer them is to fill unpopular dining mm -hmm. times. So you might be eating lunch at, you know, 2.45 p.m. or something. Yeah. But you just had normal eating times. Totally normal for both yeah, lunch think, and dinner options. I think it was pretty wide open from 10.45 a.m. until I think the latest reservation was around 4.30. And I'm sure they do that so that you're not potentially mm -hmm. missing the fantastic by dining too late. So, so let, let's talk about 50s prime time just as a restaurant while we're while we're talking about it. How was your dining experience? It was. I had mashed potatoes, mm -hmm. so that that definitely made my day. It's it's fine. I I kept getting in trouble. I'm just mm -hmm. I kept putting my elbows on the table. They it is a restaurant where the servers interact with you. 
And they, I think they do a decent job of kind of gauging your level of interaction with them. And if you're playing along, they do okay. But it can be a little jarring if you're not used to it. Alicia, of course, was very well-behaved. She sat the table without or set the table without having to be told to do it. She got the plates and everything and the napkins and silverware handed out. She was very diligent about keeping her elbows off the table and finishing her vegetables. So that worked out well for her. Me, not so much. I don't like getting in trouble. Me either, which is one thing that gives me anxiety about going there. I will say, like Heather said, that I, our server and the servers that I was observing, I feel like all did a very good job of maybe coming and starting out a little bit strong. But then if they saw how you were reacting, they let off. And like our guy that we had was, he would joke with us, but it was in a very mm -hmm. gentle way. And so... I think they're probably pretty well versed in judging if they're going into hard or not. Yeah. And but the it's food good, it's good to know how to send them that yeah. kind of how yes. it works. Yes, definitely. And I think the food is decent for what it is. It's it good portions. I liked what I got. I got salmon and it was good. The package comes with their a non alcoholic drink and either an appetizer or a dessert for each person and then an entree. So what Heather and I did was we picked one appetizer that we split. We each got our entree and then we picked a dessert to split. And everything was pretty good. It was and great. Yeah. It was quick. The theming is great. Yeah. It's a very neat restaurant to be in, especially mm -hmm. if you like that sort of style and decor. Yeah. And it, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Totally love that. Also, it can be really good for kids who need something to distract them because there's so many of the little TVs playing clips from old movie or old TV shows, you know, that can kind of help keep kids a little engaged after a busy day in the park. I also like that place for multi-generational trips because older people, it will remind them maybe of, mm -hmm. you know, their kitchens that they grew up in. And then the younger people, they can watch the clips. <laughs> like, yeah, this is old timey. Mm -hmm. But then you got vouchers for Fantasmic. Yes. Yep. You did. Yeah. And we had we did a lunch reservation, so we had lunch, got our vouchers, did a few more things around the park, and then we were able to leave and come back, which is which is nice. And then when did you go to Fantasmic with your voucher? Mm -hmm. We got there around eight ten. We just kind of wanted to see what, what the seating situation would be like, and I think on busy nights they start giving away the dining package seating at around 25 minutes 25 before minutes. the show on our night it wasn't super busy so they weren't doing that um but the dining package seats are the center two sections of phantasmic we were probably three quarters of the way up of the mm -hmm. section we were in and we got an aisle which was our priority and it was great easy mm -hmm. there are two entrances whenever you're going up to phantasmic and it'll very clearly say like dining packages one way stand by the other way and you just have to have your little card that they give you at your meal and they will direct you. And you can get out of your section and like go to the bathroom, get some mm -hmm. stuff and they'll let you come back and it's no problem. Yeah, you just need to show your your ticket. They they kind of rip it in half, like, you know, a ticket out of any event like that. And so you just got to keep your ticket on hand and then you can come and go as you want to from your section. Our night, it was only one showing a Fantasmic. And it never filled up the entire way, which is kind of reflective, I think, of the crowds that we we saw our entire trip. Even though there was only one showing, did your voucher say first showing on it by chance? I think it had the time or something. Yeah, it had it stamped. Have we have pictures of them. Okay. Because I just did a trip report with somebody that said that it said first viewing, but she's like, there's only one time. Yeah. <laughs> so I wasn't sure... I was like, that is confusing. Maybe they'll have a second time. Maybe they won't. Yeah. Ours said 9 p.m. with the date stamped on it. Your your reservation that you made for the package, which it's important for people listening, don't mm -hmm. make a reservation at the restaurant if you want this package. Make sure it's a fantastic dining package. Mm -hmm. And uh, that I don't know if the first viewing thing was part of the fantastic dining package reservation. It is. Know. Okay. Yes, it, it's listed as you choose which. I'm sure if they had both, it would. It, it tells you our set first viewing as part okay. of it. Okay. Okay. So maybe that's where the confusion is. So even if there's only one showing, it might say first viewing. Yes, because they could add a second one later. Yeah. 
For real. And then, yeah. and then the card also says seating begins 90 minutes prior to show. So our show was at 9 o'clock. So that means seating would have started at 7.30. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But and you guys it also says on there. Eight. Yes. That 25 minutes that you need to be there at least 25 minutes prior. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. So it's good for people that don't want to line up too far in advance or they want center viewing or mm -hmm. you want to take pictures from the center as opposed to the side, whatever. But also mm -hmm. it's like if you're already planning to eat at one of those places, then exactly it it's a, you know, it's a slide up charge, but you might like the reserve seating. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with charge. that a lot. And like you've said, it's a great deal on the dining plan. If you're already going to go there, it just is the same one dining credit that, or two if you're going to ho Hollywood Brown Derby that it otherwise would be. I would even say it would be silly not to because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's literally going to cost you the same. So if you're on the exactly. dining plan, you're going to eat at one of those restaurants and you want to see Fantasmic, just go ahead and book the Fantasmic dining package. Yep. Yeah. And worst case, you just don't go to the show. Yeah. Yes, it, it doesn't cost you any different. No. Mm -hmm. So that's good. This was, I think, your guys' first time using Standby Skipper this trip. So I yes. just wanted to chat about that part of it. Yeah, it was yes, Felicia's so first time. I've used it before, but this was Felicia's first time, and she just took the reins and tackled it for us. Yeah, and we did it. We only bought Genie Plus one day, and it was on our Epcot day, so... and doing attractions wasn't necessarily our focus. And so it was more just kind of testing out how it works. I think there's a slight learning curve on how to effectively use it. Mm -hmm. But I felt like even after my first day of doing things, I have an idea of like what I would do moving forward. And it it is nice to just, once you get it set up and put in what you want to let someone else handle it and mm -hmm. not have to be on your phone refreshing, looking for the times that you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did it's, you set it up to do your 7 a.m. lightning lane or did you do it yourself? I did it myself because it was the first day of the Mickey and Friends meet. And so it wasn't yet in standby skipper. Even later in the day, it was not mm -hmm. there. So it wasn't able to added. use it. Yeah. Correct. And to be fair, it also wasn't on my Disney experience mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. right before. So mm -hmm. it's not like they could have had it up earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so pretty handy. We don't always have trips that are super ride focused, so it doesn't make sense for us to use it all the time, but handy when you do want to do rides. Yeah, I yeah. think I would probably still do, I would, I likely wouldn't just set it up and let it fully do its thing mm -hmm. just because I like to micromanage a little bit more than that. But I would definitely use it in combination with you know, tweaking how I want my day to go and stuff. And once I figure out what I want, letting it handle the actual finding it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's very handy for when you want something that there's no availability for at that moment, that it it's really good at constantly checking and snagging them instead of you having to be the one doing that. Mm -hmm. My two favorite times to use it are that 7 a.m. slot because it can usually grab things faster than a human. And also... I like it to be able to snag things after that in case I'm not in a position to do it myself. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm in the middle of a conversation, if I'm on a ride or if I'm in a show or I'm going to the bathroom, like I don't want to have to be constantly setting alarms and worried about where I'm going to be when it goes off. Mm -hmm. So I really like that. And then, like you said, you can edit it. Yeah. You want, modify. You can do whatever you want with it. But I don't want to have to think about it every couple hours. Agreed. Yeah, I have so. a personal trip in the fall and I plan to, that will be attraction heavy mm -hmm. and I plan to use it then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, our personal trips tend to be a little bit more ride heavy because we are like tour guides for whoever we're traveling <laughs> with. That's exactly right. Okay, so I think that was all the repeat things I had jotted down, but you mentioned using Standby Skipper on your Epcot day, mm -hmm. which is what I want to talk about next because this is the new stuff. Yes. So June 10th. Epcot had some new stuff opening, yeah. including the walls going away. Tumbling down. Mm -hmm. So talk about Epcot and how it is now. Well, there's no more walls, which is really good. I think that's the big thing. It was there, a... There are people listening to this have never seen Epcot without those walls. That blows my mind. And I feel bad for them. But I'm also now excited because when they go... 
they should see Epcot without having to worry about trying to figure out how you're going to get across the park oh. or when at rope drop, which direction you need to go because they've only got these little pathways open to get from one side to the other. You can now go across the park, all the directions. The new things that opened were primarily the last phase of the construction, which was Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza, which in the opening days of the discussion for Epcot uh, looked a little different in their a lot different in their concept drawings. Um, and while we do have something there now, like there is something for Communicore Hall and Communicore Plaza, I think we have to mourn a little bit what we could have had. What was supposed to have been like this two-story festival spot where you could have fireworks viewing, you know, at night and then during the daytime it would be have festival geared things is now a room with some banners, which is still nice because it's air conditioned, right? Like you get air conditioning and stuff there. There's a state. This feels like an abusive relationship where you just accept the bare Mm -hmm. minimum. Like, they're nice to me sometimes. Yeah. I mean, at least they gave me a chair. That was nice. And they even put trash cans in there. Air conditioning. No bathrooms Mm -hmm. or plugs, but there is air conditioning. There's a stage where they're going to have rotating shows right now. It's Encanto and it's a sing along, which was very well done, extremely cute. There is a Mickey and Friends character meet, which replaces the former character spot from years and years ago. And that's what you guys had a lightning lane for. And that's, yes, yes, that is the newest addition to GD Plus at Epcot. And also a good bang for the buck because there's three characters. Mm -hmm. Yes. For one lightning lane. Yeah. And they are the stereotypical, at least two of them, you know, some of the stereotypical characters people want to meet when they go to Disney World. It's Mickey, Minnie, and then uh, Goofy as well. Goofy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good use of a lightning if you want to meet those characters. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that opened right there was Festival Favorites, which is a window counter service, quick service location that serves Festival Favorites, hence the name. They're is, just, it, is it Festival Favorites? Or are they, is it leftover stuff from previous festivals that they have to use up? Was it good? It was delicious. So I guess it was Festival Favorites. I, it, was, I, it was very good. The, and it was all in Kanto themed. I think the food is definitively festival favorites. Mm -hmm. And they were some food items that we've seen at prior festivals that I think are always on our favorites, personal favorites list. Mm -hmm. And some were from the most previous festival, were they, Felicia? It was like several festivals ago. Yeah, the two savory items were from 2022. It was Mm -hmm. the last time I think we saw them at a festival booth. And then the dessert is something that we see regularly. Mm -hmm. And then the drinks we were speculating, I think, is just some... leftover beer (laughs) options but there Uh are a lot and it's a wide variety and Mm -hmm. they're good and there was no line that was the thing that was wildest to us was we were expecting and i think disney was expecting larger crowds than what was actually there because there was hardly a line for the characters there was zero line for festival favorites it was very easy to get a spot even for for the first showing of the encanto show it was very bizarre. Summer is just not as busy as it no. has to be. No, that that's something we saw our entire trip. I think every day we're in the parks, we said, I cannot believe how empty it is. Mm-hmm. Which, if you don't frequently go, or mm-hmm. it will probably still feel very busy to you. Yes. But as people that go frequently and see where you can't mm-hmm. see in front of you because there are so many people, having like walking around World Showcase and being able to see to the next pavilion for instance, uh-huh. is very it was, odd. It's wild. Seven Dwarfs but Mine nice. Train on our Magic Kingdom Day, a 40-minute standby wait at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. I look forward to people coming back from their summer trips and telling us how wrong we were I, because their trip was crowded. And it's like, compared to what? Yeah. What are you, what mm-hmm. are you comparing it to? Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. We also, Memorial Weekend, not crowded. Not crowded. So wild. Mm -mm. Yes. And that makes everything easier, like easier Mm -hmm. to get into restaurants. We had no trouble getting any reservations we wanted, which isn't to say that they were available all the time. But using all of the tools and tricks you can to get them was very Mm -hmm. easy. Like 
We had tons of options for Space 220 Lounge, even though we didn't get it booked at the 60-day mark. Same with our Fantasmic package. We 1900 that, Park Fair. 1900 Park Fair we moved several times, including while we were there. It was just, that makes it easy. The, at Space 220 at one point, they were seeking out people to come dine there, which mm-hmm. yeah. are the Lightning Lanes, like Genie Plus selections. They were all very, like, you could just keep getting them. So even though it is busy and you're still going to have to wait and there's still mm-hmm. people, it's just a totally different experience. Than if you go when you can't get a dining reservation, mm-hmm. your next Genie Plus is four hours out to like. It's, yeah, mm-hmm. the, it's are, the Tron nicer. virtual queue was open. I don't know how late it was. It was like two thirty-five. We got a, which the the second queue opens at one p.m. and it was two thirty-five, and we were able to join the queue and got called back at seven something that night for it. That is unheard of for us. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. I also maintain that not only is there lower crowds, but the crowds that are there don't know about a lot of the things. Like mm-hmm. they're not making reservations 60 days out. They're not mobile ordering. Maybe they don't know how to join the virtual queue. You know, Genie Plus is probably not on there. Yeah, they clearly list. didn't know about Epcot stuff opening because they were not there. Yes. It's shocking. It, I it's think, a great time, I think, for planners to go, but you just have to be prepared if it's going to be extra hot like it was whenever we were there and it not being super busy allows you to take breaks and kind Mm -hmm. of have a leisurely trip that you still accomplish a lot and you don't have to feel as stressed like Mm -hmm. running from place to place or standing outside all day even if it's a little bit cooler like it's nice yeah so planners have an advantage always but especially when non-planners are traveling i it's Talking about it not being busy and Disney probably expect it to be busy. I think sometimes when they have something that's popular, like Encanto, they assume if they just say Encanto that the people will come. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, a stage show is probably not enough to get people to book a trip. So yeah, to do something better than that. A temporary stage show at that, too. Yes. You can't just throw out the word Moana and be like, oh, people are here, you know. But anyway, so... We'll see how it goes. I, I expect it'll probably look a lot like this through most of the summer. Yes. Another, I'm going to put this in quote, new things. It's the Animal Kingdom Lion King stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the 30th anniversary of the Lion King. So mm-hmm. Animal Kingdom is doing some Lion King stuff for the summer. Mm-hmm. But it they are masters at making it seem like an announcement or a special event. But it's not really. No. I think the only thing that they announced that was actually new for the event were the food and drink items and I guess the merchandise. Yes. And not even all of the food and drink or merchandise was actually new. No. Mm-hmm. So there were several things. There was meeting Timon and Rafiki at Planet Watch, which they've been available to meet plenty of times before. The animation experience at conservation station is lion king themed which they've done before and they often do those characters so that's not unusual there was the food and drink there was the merchandise there were popcorn buckets which they've had for a while now they had photo pass experiences that have been up since the 25th anniversary Um, of the lion king 25th (laughs) anniversary yes so sorry for the last five years they've been available Uh is that everything if you like the popcorn bucket yeah, the pop and the popcorn bucket is my favorite because it's the what they made a big deal about was Pumba, mm-hmm. but they literally like pulled Pumba back in April or whatever, and then they brought him back June tenth. Yeah, or like who the Pumba popcorn bucket is back, so Ta-da. that made me laugh. It's magic, huh? Yeah, so that's basically it. So you guys did all that, but also it was in the middle of torrential downpours. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, the day that. We felt really lucky because we did have a lot to do, but we were able to just hop from place to place and then sit under covering while it poured for an hour. Mm-hmm. And then we, you know, move on to the next little, one in between a downpour, move on to the next one and sit inside. And if that was my first trip or my only trip, mm-hmm. it would be very frustrating and disappointing because even if, you know, plenty of the attractions were closed during that. But even if they weren't, you're still soaked and it's not ideal. It wasn't like a little bit of rain you can deal with. It was lightning, thunder, 
for two seconds and you're going to be in bad Downpour. shape. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the attractions. I mean, because indoor attractions are fine during the weather, but you have Expedition Everest, you have the safari, you have any of the characters that are outside, any like the walking paths, like so much of Animal Kingdom is not, there's not an indoor part of it. So that you are left with very few options. You have Vessel of the Lion King, the Nemo show, Dinosaur, and it's tough to be a bug. And I guess probably like over in Pandora, you have those two. But that's what, five things that you could do outside of dining? And mm-hmm. so that's kind of disappointing. And you guys went to Nomad Lounge mm-hmm. and was it easy to get in? It was it was way too easy to get in. So we got in over and over and over again. And we were not prepared. So no. for people that go regularly um, or have been before, it's not uncommon to get, you know, a 75 minute wait time like when you check in on the app and you kind of have to plan where you're going to be and when you need to get there. And for our experience, we kept trying to join and it would say, oh, it'll be a 35 minute wait. And then we would get called back immediately. Or we'd look and it would still be 10 minutes all day long. And so we joined multiple times and then had to decline because we just were not ready to be there. And that's bizarre. It was Um, very bizarre. We were slightly worried that they were going to blacklist us for as many times as we were joining and declining. But they were just nobody was going there. They were churning through people too quickly. I would have been thinking that people would have stayed longer to try to avoid going out into the rain. But... That was not the case. But I think, you know, non-planners or first-time visitors, mm-hmm. they don't know that it's there. I think Nomad Lounge is the litmus test for me about who is there and how busy it is. Mm-hmm. Because you, you guys, we've all rope dropped it before. <laughs> like, yep. Because when you're going during times when a lot of planners are there, you have to. It gets so busy. And we will like... Join the waitlist in person, join the waitlist in the app. Like Mm -hmm. all of us do it, whoever gets called. It's very competitive sometimes. And then we also had the same experience as you when we were there over Memorial Weekend, where we arrived close to lunchtime and we just got in. Like it was easy. (laughs) Yeah, it was bizarre. And also that's where we talked to the most podcast listeners because they all were there too. (laughs) It's like, if you know, you know, and Mm -hmm. it's a place we go to over and over again. Speaking of that place, I feel like we should do a whole like article about places we would go to over and over again, because I feel like some places are one and done and some places Mm -hmm. we go to over and over again. Like I think Space 220 could be a one and done. Mm -hmm. It's a great experience. Interesting. I think a lot of people should probably see it, especially if they do the lounge option. But you don't necessarily want to go back over and over again. Mm -mm. Nomad Lounge. Constant. Mm -hmm. Every trip, I think. Yeah. I think there's two things we do every trip. The people mover and Nomad Lounge. (laughs) That's it. Yeah. That's you know, one it. place that I think about going to frequently and the only reason I don't want to is getting there is Sebastian's Bistro. Mm-hmm. I would happily eat there every yes. single trip. It's priced well and it's delicious. Yeah. But yes. You have to get over there. So there's Yes. That. Getting there is tricky. Speaking of, you were, also, you were at Pop Century just like we were at Pop Century. Did you guys run into connection issues the way that we did? I did not like no. like Wi-Fi or cell. It, it it probably depends where your room is, but we were so far away that we just like straight up didn't have connection sometimes. No, I had issues one day, but I restarted my computer and it was fine. But I I know the experience that you're talking about. I've certainly had that, and it wasn't like that at all for us. But we had I feel like a pretty good we yeah we had a good we, yeah we were where were you? We were building in building 10, ten the seventy section. But we were kind of centrally, well, we were, we were closer toward the 80 and 90 section, like where we were at in that building. Mm-hmm. I do think overall, I personally prefer the preferred mm-hmm. rooms at Pop just because you can get a standard room that is great to be close to like the Skyliner and stuff. But you also run the risk of getting an 80s or 90s section room or something mm-hmm. that feels very far away. Yeah, I think there's far fewer good standard options then they're like that risk is pretty high yeah ours was still a little bit of a walk to the skyliner but it was Mm -hmm. one of what i think is a i feel like we got lucky with our location for standard i do too yeah i'm looking at the map right now to visualize 
where you were in building 10. We were in building six, but along the water, like all the way on the end, along the water. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. found that annoying. Yeah. I had requested a 70s building and got it, but like, you know, that's not exactly what I had in mind. Yeah. If ours, the buildings being a T, we were toward Mm -hmm. the bottom of the T, like that juts out towards 80s, 90s. And we had second okay. floors, so that wasn't bad either because it was only one mm-hmm. set of stairs. That's close to the bus stop. Yeah, it was very close to the buses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because yeah. you can go around. Not you so close to, to the Skyliner. The yeah, mm-hmm. and we were close to the Skyliner, but it just, I don't know, just so far away. And because of the heat that was during both of our trips, it, it's, it made it feel more intense to me. Everything gets amplified. Yeah. yeah. But you guys did the request in the app, the chat. Mm-hmm. in the app to request their better room. So maybe that helped. Yeah, although I do think that, or, or at least I would have to wonder if the fact that we got there early and we went ahead and went to the desk and asked if they had anything available, if that negates anything that we did in the chat, because then we wouldn't get our assigned room. we just probably get whatever they had available. Mm-hmm. Yep, that is possible as well. You were talking about Sebastian's Bistro, which is on the Skyliner and, mm-hmm. you know, it's at a Skyliner resort. And I had the same thought as you, which when we were there, which was, we need somewhere to eat tonight. I really want to go to that Sebastian's Bistro. But then I kept thinking, like, I don't really want to navigate all the way over to the other side. So I was almost mm-hmm. thinking, like, an Uber would Uber. be better. But instead, we went to Bar Riva at Riviera. And I think that's going to be my go-to now because it's more direct on the Skyliner. Mm-hmm. Still a little bit of a walk, but Riviera is so much smaller than Caribbean Beach. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I think if I was looking somewhere that I was either driving or Ubering to, Sebastian's would be my choice. But I would mm-hmm. not go there on the Skyliner, even though it's a Skyliner resort, just because yeah. it is such a hike to get there. It is, off it is a long Either walk. of the Skyliner stops there, the Riviera yeah. or the Caribbean Beach. So I feel like if we do a compilation of places we would go to over and over again, it has to take into consideration how easy it is to get there. Mm-hmm. Because Nomad Lounge, as long as you're going to Animal Kingdom, very easy to get to. <laughs> but Sebastian's Bistro, not super convenient to most people, mm-hmm. even though it is hands down one of the most underrated, bang, best bang for the buck dinners. Agreed. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's a really good food there. Is there anything that you guys did that I haven't mentioned yet no i don't think didn't miss anything okay i tried i mean i tried to hit all the points oh no because i followed along yeah you you didn't think i would but i did did not (laughs) other little things but nothing was that noteworthy nothing yes nothing we're sharing discussing (laughs) so anyway I appreciate you guys doing a good job. It's a new dynamic for us to split up and do our trips like this, but it just kind of made sense in this case. So we'll see how the next trip goes. We do have plans with all of us together in the future in a couple months. So we'll be back together then. But anyway, thanks for chatting and uh, welcome back home. Thank Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I always like talking to them because I adore them. And there is an after chat for this episode up on Patreon where we talked about how it was for them to do this trip by themselves as well as some off-topic things because they did record for Patreon every day of the trip. And I wanted to ask them about some of the things that they shared there. So that is up on Patreon right now. So if you're Patreon, go check it out. It is in video and audio form. I think that will wrap up this episode of WW Preps to Go. For more information, please check the show notes in your podcast app or head to the website, www.prepschool.com. Click on podcast at the top, scroll down to episode 414. Until next time, I will see you on the site.